We're live in the Santan Valley. Tom DiCamillo, Joe Carrero. This is CAC Live. It's 1030 on Thursday morning. We're always here from 1030 to 1130 in the Valley talking about Central Arizona College. And today we have a couple of special guests with us. We're going to talk about community education and programs for people that are interested. Maybe they're not going to take credit classes, but they're going to be interested in getting personal development or a whole myriad of classes that you'll be able to take at Central Arizona College under community education. And joining us is Muriel Tom. Thomas and did I say your last name right? Yes. Okay, I, for a minute there, I was like, "Wait a minute, I messed that up." And Joel Beck and Joel's been with CAC for a, for a long time. Welcome to both of you to the to the program. Thank you. I know we've wanted to have you on for a long time. You guys have been very busy because you you, you cover the entire county, don't you, Joel? We do. Between Muriel and I, we're the only two um, that do our job in the entire Pinal County. And uh, the, the county is as big as the state of Connecticut, so you have uh, put a lot of mileage out there. We do. Covering the different things. Lots so let's, of mileage. <laughs> so, Joel, let's talk a little bit, start with you first. Um, and I know you've been involved with CAC for years. You were here long before I was here at CAC. Talk about what is the community ed program like at Central Arizona College? What can people expect to, to learn or do if they take classes? We offer a lot of different classes um, from different areas of just discipline. Um, we do a lot of fun non-credit um, classes. We do cultural trips, um, cultural events, um, a lot of fun stuff. Fun non-credit, short, um, energetic, fun, no tests, um, just no fun studying. stuff coming to school, no studying. Is it? I always tell people when I just describe it that it seems. I said, "Look, do you have grandkids?" Yes. I said, "Do you want to learn how to share photos with them, or take fo get their photos and or take photos of them and send them to them, or, or do you want to learn how to Skype with them?" And they go, "Yes, we'd like to do that." And I said, "There's programs like that that people can learn." Yeah, we offer a lot of computer classes. We've actually developed a couple this semester. So one is like an iPad class. Um, a beginning and a more advanced class, and then how to use a smartphone. So a lot of people are excited about that. Do those fill up pretty quick? This seems like the computer type classes. Yes. yes. They're very popular in all of the areas. So how do you decide what to offer? It kind of depends on maybe what a community member might propose to you. Uh, we look at a lot of what the needs are within the community. So it could be with um, a community survey or just people approaching you and the CCO is being able to help us and we help each other. And the CCOs are the community outreach coordinators yes. that go out into the community so they hear stuff. So you work a lot with a lot of different departments at CAC. Many different departments. Like the entire college. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, if, uh, so if I'm somebody in the listening today and I have an interest in a type of class and it's not something that maybe is offered. Is that something I could come to either of you and say, Hey, I have me and my friends and I are, we'd like to learn this. Is something you would ever offer? Is that how you learn a lot about a lot of different things? We do. Um, we go out in the community a lot and do like Muriel said, the community needs surveys. And whenever we find a, an interest and there's a high response to it, we'll find an instructor and then offer the class in those locations if possible. Sometimes we're challenged, but, um, or it's a challenge to find somebody, but for the most part, we, we do we our do best. That. And I think we do pretty well because we're, we get really lucky and we find an instructor who's willing to do it. Um, sometimes it happens really late. We have students, maybe six, seven, eight students are wanting to take a particular class. And then we have to try to get the instructor and get it mm -hmm. all set up and usually it just falls through perfectly it's when, it's interesting because when you talk about instructors are there p instructors that come to you and, and that move into the county or move into the area and say hey uh, i have this skill i think people might be interested and then do you develop a course around it yeah it works both ways we have the community coming saying that they want this type of class and we also have instructors saying hey i, ha I taught this class back east or i have this idea of doing something do you think there would be an interest and we can move forward that way but what are some of the most popular courses? I mean, we talk about like the tech courses there, but are there ones that really like people just like fill up like that, that they are, they're sort of waiting at your door to sign up for? I would say art classes, um, painting and drawing. Really? Um, photography. Um, at SMC, photography is very popular. Um, and SMC is a Superstition Mountain campus up in Apache, up, up in Apache Junction. So I guess with the, this, the, proliferation of digital cameras especially the ones now that 
are really you can buy them they're not that expensive and but it, it's so much cheaper than the old days buying a camera and then investing thousands of dollars in right. a film that now everybody has them but i have a uh, a rebel uh canon rebel and i think i do pretty well i don't know what all the buttons are on there do you teach that there are there classes where they can there is a uh, beginner's digital photography how to work your camera and you bring your manual to class and it's kind of a short and sweet overview of basic digital cameras but they point out things in your manual to help you understand so where are those classes taught are they mostly at smc or are they can they depend on where throughout the district that particular class i think we've kind of had in every single area because i offer mm. it down in saddlebrook and in Aravaipa. I think in Florence too, in don't you? Florence. Oracle, Florence, Superstition Mountain, Santan, mm -hmm. and Cass Grant. Are all the classes offered at the CAC locations, or do you try to end up with other, do you have other sort of partnerships, you know, maybe at a, you know, at a facility that's owned by a city or something? Do you work with them to do some of your programming? I actually work with the city of Maricopa and the city of Cass Grand's park and Parks and Recreation Departments. So we offer classes within this, those cities. And then also we work a lot with high schools. So we might offer a class at an elementary school in Mammoth or even Oracle High School. So it's just or Oracle Elementary mm -hmm. School, uh, San Manuel High School. So, you know, we're kind of everywhere. So, th I mean, imagine, I'm trying to imagine this for the both of you. There's probably a lot of paperwork involved in setting these up because you're dealing with so many entities. You're smiling. <laughs> we kill trees. Yeah. <laughs> we rely on technology, too, though. There's a lot of stuff can be done digitally, but, yes, there's a lot of paperwork. So what's the biggest challenge for your for your jobs? Is it is is it just sort of getting through all the, the setup processes? If, I can imagine if you're setting up something at a public school that there's a lot of processes that those schools have as opposed to doing it on your own campus where you kind of know what's going on. You call up, get a room, and can do it. Very challenging. It takes a lot of time. Um, mm. I think some people don't understand that it takes, it, there's there's a process. Mm. And so having to work with um, schools, we have to exchange paperwork, um, insurance, liable, well, insurance policies. And so we work a lot with Deborah Galvan. And so we're communicating kind of on a daily basis until that entire agreement's in place. And then we can offer a class. I, I used to run a softball league for 11 years back in Pennsylvania, and I'd have to use school district fields and then use, go through the city to get fields and then some private organizations. And I remember as a volunteer how much paperwork and going through the school districts, that it was for each, I had to do like 11 pages for each field that we used and then have insurance. So it really does take up a lot of your time. People probably don't realize that. I think that's one of our challenges, but also just being so large. Like you said, we're the county is the size of the state of Connecticut, and we have one publication that goes out, and people say, oh, um, there's basket weaving, introduction to basket weaving at, in Casa Grande. Well, people in the Apache Junction want that class over there. Well, we would need to find an instructor. So some people say, oh, I want to take the Italian class, and Italian's offered in Apache Junction, and they're all the way in Saddlebrook. So the needs... Um, even though there's some common needs or wants, um, it's just sometimes kind of difficult to find an instructor to meet those needs in those areas. So geography plays a huge factor of where people live, where your instructors live, where your needs are. Exactly. And then just, yeah, going from Saddlebrook to Apache Junction to take a class is probably a three-hour round trip by the time, four-hour round trip by the time you do that. Yeah. So, but... Um, it's, have you seen over the years, Joel, you've, like I said, you've been here a long time. Have you seen, like, who, who are the biggest customers? Or is it, is, is it seniors? Is it winter visitors? Um, all of the above. Um, a lot of winter visitors, um, retirees, seniors. Um, we do have some people who are in the workforce who are still taking classes. Um, they take advantage of our night and weekend classes. Um, but yeah, pretty much retirees, senior citizens. And talk talk a little bit about that. You know, people hear stuff like continuing education, community education. CAC had a program called the Central Arizona Lifelong Learners. Um, and at CAC, talk a little bit about that. What is the basis of a community of a community education? What's its mission, and why do why do what do colleges do that? We try and meet the needs of the community. Um, obviously, higher education. 
there's the people who are trying to get degrees, but we also have lifelong learners who, people who just want to learn and explore new things. And this is a way to do it without having to pay um, for per credit classes or take a 15 week course and working towards a degree. So it's more fun, personal enrichment type things um, that we like to offer just so we can meet the needs of the community. Uh, talk a little bit about Muriel about meeting the needs of the community when you're going out and, and developing classes and we talked about you know you find instructors you find people that have an interest but when you're going out looking how do you kind of wade through all that to, to really understand what's going to work best I think it um, a lot of it depends on the demographics um, um, you have to look at a lot of things because I take care of Saddlebrook and that's very different from um, the people over in Maricopa or Cascarin. So in Saddlebrook, I tend to offer Arizona history classes, um, Spanish, computers, and Cascarin could be totally different where I've, the holistic classes have been uh, in demand. They like to do the Reikis one, two, and three. And so every single area is different that there are certain classes that we can offer at all the areas and they're going to be in demand and they're going to want to be taken but then we have others who are not going to make at all at another area because the interest just isn't there so it's a big variety of classes because of the variety of people that are wanting to take our classes pinnell uh pinnell county is so diverse i mean we look at it even from the credit classes standpoint you look at it at the community when we deal with it so you, it, it's almost like you have to set up community ed programs almost based on each of the areas and, and that takes true. a lot of time that's very true and so it's challenging and so we're continuously busy and i don't think we ever have a downtime it's just every day we're working on something new how far in advance do you guys work to set up the to set up these classes because obviously when you do like when cac has its credit classes you kind of know here's you know here's your Englishes, here's your sciences, here's your maths, and they know what they're going to teach. It's not that they had to reinvent that. They might have to slot them in times that are best for the community. But that those they're developed. It almost like with you guys, you it's almost like you're developing classes and have to develop new and different classes all the time. Each and every semester, we try and offer new new courses and new um, ideas and proposals just for our offerings. Um, I think right now we're kind of finalizing up our spring schedule, but at the same time we're already looking at summer and we're all already looking yeah. at the fall. So, for instance, like for Maricopa, I already have a French instructor wanting to teach in the fall because she didn't want to be bombarded with paperwork so quickly, so she's put it off for a semester. So um, we already kind of look into the future ahead of time and try to make new classes all the time. As Muriel said, we're already winding down on our spring 2014 schedule, and we're already working on summer 2014. Wow. Wow. You're listening to CAC Live, Tom DiCamillo, uh, along with Joe Carrero, who stepped away from the, the studio for a little bit. Uh, we're visiting with Muriel Thomas and Joel Beck from Central Arizona College's Lifelong Learning Program, Community Education Program. We call it a lifelong learning program a lot of times because, as you said, Joel, Joel that people just want to learn throughout their lifetime. Do you think they do that because it keeps them active and sharp i think it does i think it does that's what we hear a lot oh you know um i'm getting older and i just want to stimulate my mind so we offer all kinds of classes as we've been discussing um, health and wellness um, art uh, computers languages personal interest type things um, and it just stimulates the mind one of the big things in apache junction is mahjong so we have about 15 people who are wow. playing mahjong each and every semester. And is that, do you think that's that the role of the community ed is just putting the word community in their community? In other words, it get, it's, a, it's a way for them to connect. It seems like with playing mahjong or some of the other things that they've done, and at least in Apache Junction, there seems to be a lot of people that are winter visitors that that's they're all over the country then they come back and that's how they reconnect with all their friends and people they know through CAC would you say that's accurate I say that's very accurate um, something I've been saying over the years is just that we put the unity in community is what I've been saying mm -hmm. that and it's kind of 
come across through the department and just through the <laughs> participants because they say it's true. You know, I would have never had these friends say um, some somebody loses their spouse and they're out in Gold Canyon, just moved here from Nebraska, and they say, okay, so I need to meet new friends, do things. We offer the lunch and conversation where people can get together and meet new friends at a restaurant and you buy your lunch and just sit and meet new people. So we do things like that, and I think that a lot of people, a lot of good relationships and friends over the years. That's one of the things that we always hear. Yeah, and touching on the lunch and conversation in um, the southern part of the county, it wasn't very well attended, but within the last probably year, uh, we had maybe five, six um, individuals that go to lunch every month, and now we're up to like 16 wow. individuals. So like Joel said, they kind of sit, and then us showing up and having lunch with them, we can share with them what the new courses are so that they can in turn share it with their friends. Did you, with a, with a program, it's always interesting to me, the lunch and conversation. It was really, when I looked at that, it was really sort of this, almost a marketing tool for the call on the community ed program that exactly what you said, Muriel, allowed people to come together, make some friends, but then it gave an opportunity to show people what else was going on. Did you, did you, did you start to see from that type of program people taking other classes? Yes. And that's where one of our new classes just started, which is um, Yoga Gold. And it's for 50 plus individuals and um, it's basically chair yoga. And that's kind of something they wanted. So chair yoga? Chair yoga. Interesting. It's very interesting. It's, it's, uh, does it, uh, Joel, I, I've always seen how you've interacted with, especially the, the seniors that have come and, and they always, they're, they're really comfortable around you. You always make them feel very welcome. It, it always seemed to me in your role that you kind of really enjoyed this and because and, you make a difference. Is that how you feel? Um, I do feel, I really do enjoy it. Um, I enjoy helping the community and especially at that age, they feel like sometimes they're, coming back to school and they you know we don't want to do academic type things we want to do fun things and they're they're my voice as to into the community the people that i've been working with and take classes over and over um they talk about the college they speak to the community and they come back and report as to what kinds of things they're hearing out in the community so we do have a really good relationship and i enjoy um, interacting with them, I really enjoy what I do. I enjoy working with the people that I do. What are some of the things that you heard that you've heard over the years that people have come and after they've experienced some of the classes? I mean, what do they say to you? Like, do they do they say this has really been a place for me to, to network and get to know people? I just I've learned things. This is exciting. I love what you do. I mean, it seems like very positive. It is. There's a lot of positive things coming out um, of just what we do for our job. Um, a lot of friendships, a lot of people go on road trips together, they go back home, their families get together, um, a lot of good stuff. Um, I know people just over my years of being in the department, uh, people who decide to step out of their comfort zone and take an art class. Well, one lady that really sticks out in my mind, she was very hesitant. She's like, I've always wanted to draw. I've never had the time to do it. She ended up doing it. And she's still taking art classes with us. And she's a great artist. Like she's really? entered things into the Arizona state fair, um, competition. So she never knew that that was something that she could do. So positive stories like that, good stories, just good things like that. How do you guys feel about the community college and its role philosophically in doing this? Is, is it important that community ed be a part of a of a community college role, you know, role in the community. I think our presence is really great. Um, I think it's important because if we weren't there, we wouldn't be meeting their needs. Whether it was like Joel says for personal interest, personal growth, or just because they were very curious, didn't have time earlier in their life to do something, and now they have the opportunity. And so that's where a lot of the students are coming, like Joel said, to take a painting course or a language course. And then like the winter visitors just coming in and trying to learn more about Arizona because now this is their new home. So I think, you know, it's valuable. I think they enjoy taking part of the other things that CAC has to offer, um, the campus openings, the science nights, those kinds of things, because they're involved and invited to those kinds of things. And to be 
it's like full circle, they say. You know, I remember when I was in college and we were doing these things, we never saw people of our age now doing this. So like in Apache Junction at the Superstition Mountain Campus, when it's a campus-wide event and everybody's there, they enjoy being there with the young people and sharing stories with them and like, oh, what are you taking? Just meet and greet type of thing. So I know that's something that they enjoy doing. And just to stimulate their mind, they enjoy learning. Um, and like Muriel said, if they didn't have time to do something when they were younger, when they were getting their degrees, it's something fun for them to come back to college. Do you guess, Do you have any idea where most, the ones that, the winter visitors that do attend, that take, that take the program and take the classes, kind of get any sense of what part of the country they're coming from and do they come from areas where back home in the summer when they're there are they doing the same type thing at their local colleges we have people from all over all over the world sometimes yeah. um and the, it's just kind of a variety of people um that i don't know you know what they do back home i'm sure it's the same thing i know some will take dance classes back home at a community college and come here hoping that we're going to offer you know a continuance so that they can continue to ballroom dance when, when do you start getting calls from do you start getting calls from winter visitors like before they're here or you know saying hey i want to start you know when's the catalog coming out i want to start signing up for classes i'll let joel answer that yeah they, it's all year um they keep in we keep in contact with our students also via email and just keep them up to date as to what's happening or what's coming up or what to look for um but yeah though they know when it's okay so the fall semester's coming we need to register now so let's get on the list or let's see what we need to do so we don't miss out on an opportunity and if it's a limited class or just space availability or if we're doing it in an event and there's a certain amount of tickets um but Joel do, does a great job because he's able to send them the PDF file of our schedule ahead of time. So when they're back home, they can take a look at it and know what they're going to take when they get here. Or they're already registering and faxing in the registration form. We're visiting with Muriel Thomas and Joel Beck from the Community Education Program at Central Arizona College. I'm Tom DiCamillo. We are here at CAC Live every Thursday from 1030 to 1130 a.m. And let's talk a little bit about the catalog. I know you have a copy of it here. Uh, first of all, the catalog is for the fall semester, right? Correct. So you do one for fall, one for spring, and one for summer. Yes, correct. Three year, three year. And uh, talk a little. Let's talk a little bit about first. Where can people get this catalog? Um, in my area, we leave them at doctors' offices at restaurants. And you're in Casa Grande. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just in want to Casa remind. <laughs> in Casa Grande, it would mm. be at restaurants, doctors' offices, anywhere that they allow me to place the catalogs. And then in Coolidge, it's at the library, Eloy, the library, Arizona City, the library, in Saddlebrook at the Saddlebrook Center. It is also online with Robson Ranch. And so they are able to advertise for us. For the city of Maricopa, because of the partnership we have, they hand out um, their brochures, which include all of our classes. And then plus we leave them in businesses over in that area. And um, in Santan, in Apache Junction, and even eastern Maricopa County, um, they are at the Chamber of Commerce, libraries, um, housing communities, um, restaurants, grocery stores, at all of our campuses and locations and, and online. And people will be able to pick them up at the YMCA at our display there uh, once the printed versions here are out over uh, at the Copper Basin YMCA. We have a big display there, so we'll, we'll, if people are listening, can pick them up there. We do get a lot of listeners from uh, around the country. We get a lot of listeners from Canada uh, to the show. So if people want, if they're, maybe they're considering moving here, they're moving here, don't know the area, a little bit is there, what's the website where they can go on and, and find this catalog? www.centralaz.edu forward slash lifelong learning. And that'll have the option for the PDF. And you guys did a really neat thing this year. You have a flip sort of catalog. It's I was looking book. at it's a flip book. Explain what that is, how the PDF that's on there that's email is kind of static. You kind of scroll down through the whole book. But this one pages. Yeah, it's the P beautiful. we actually did this yesterday. <laughs> um, <laughs> the PDF, yes, you scroll page by page. It's just a long document. Um, the flip book is what it does is it creates an electronic book kind of like a nook and you mm -hmm. can flip page by page as you would in a book 
So it's just a tool that um, we utilize, or something new that we're starting to utilize, which is a tool. Um, so it, it's just a flip book. You just flip like a book, electronic book. <laughs> How do people sign up for classes? They do it online? Do they call? Do they have to fill out a form? How does it work? The majority of the class, um, students would have to do a hard copy of the registration form, and that's included in the schedule, or they can pick it up at any of the registration offices. And um, the only difference for me would be the city of Cass Grand and the city of Cass, uh, Maricopa. They would have to do it online at those particular um, locations, usually at their Parks and Rec office. So they can go, because of the partnership we have there, our programs are running in conjunction with yes. those two cities. So those are all done online? Yes. So people can go to the city websites yes. or they can go to our website and link to bounce over to the city yes e either on the park and recs department so why don't you guys talk a little uh, talk about some of the highlights what are some of the classes this fall that you guys are offering you want to go first yes um in apache junction and in santan um, we are offering a series of photography classes um, photographing animals and uh, portraits um a, a large series of uh, photography classes. We're also doing Tai Chi and meditation. Um, we're doing some art classes in Florence along with computer classes. And those are some highlights. Wh when do they start? Are they getting underway now? Are they? Um, the good thing, we're, we're flexible as a non-credit program. Um, we have different start dates depending on, you know, instructors, um, w everybody's schedule. So classes started last week, and we have them continuing. Some are one-day classes, so they're maybe in November or whatnot. But we have different start dates, so there's always something going on. We tend to offer things a little bit sooner in the spring, where in the fall we offer them a little bit later in the semester. But because the winter visitors are already here, so we try to just start right away before they leave in April. It's... Uh I'd like to talk a little bit about, because I've got to know some of the instructors. Um, I think it's a, a photography instructor. Is it Mimi Robido? Mimi Robido, yeah. Yeah, that does, uh, I think she does a really good job. But talk about some some of the instructors. That's a big thing. People want to know who's teaching the cla some of the classes. And maybe you could tell the listeners about some of the people that, that are really have good skill sets that are teaching some of these classes. We have a lot of instructors in what we've done this past two schedules is at the very back we have the biography short biographies of each of the instructors and it kind of tells um a student what the what their what their background their is background is what kind of education they've had and the majority of them either studied that or they've just done this um skill for many many years do you i'm i'm, I'm guessing that having something like that really because uh, I saw that with the bios and when, you know, where I came from, community ed, there wasn't a community college in the county I lived and it was done by the high schools, mm -hmm. the school districts. And that was very common in the east of, from eastern Pennsylvania. And it was very common that the school districts did it, not the community colleges. Um, so, uh, it, but I've never seen bios of the instructors, which I think really probably helps answer questions, you know, if people call. I think so people can relate. The student can relate with the instructor and see where they come from. I think that that's been a good idea, and I've heard positive feedback over the past few semesters that we've done that on the schedule. Because before we did this, we were getting the calls, and so we'd have to pull a file and have to share with <laughs> and them. Ask those, and answer those questions, yes. which takes up a lot of time yes. <laughs> to do. So the um, you talk about some, uh, like specifically, I'd be interested to know some of the classes that, have been offered over the years. Um, what are some of the unusual ones that have been really popular? Gee, there's been hundreds. Um, <laughs> I know. Maybe it's not so unusual. We'll pick one, Joel. What's one that you saw that that maybe popped up on the schedule and you went, I don't know if that's going to work, and then it was like, wow, that really worked. There's just been so many. Batty over bats. So people, it was a class about bats, like the history of bats and how, where they live in Arizona and just all about bats. It was batty over bats is what the class was. And we didn't know how that was going to run a couple of years ago. And there were like 25 people in it. Really? Yeah. 
And then we took a trip to the Karshner Caverns after that. So a lot of people wanted to see them because they lived down in the Karshner Cavern, apparently. Yeah, like 2007 to 10, I noticed because we were developing um, the curriculum on new forms. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I was telling Joel, and he goes, oh, yeah, those are my classes. And they do. They, they're they very unique titles. and But they were classes that made with a lot of students. Just cl- um, classes about gravity, just interesting facts about gravity and how it affects our daily life. Um, do you ever pop into any of the classes just so you can kind of get a feel of of what the subject matter is? Yeah, we do. Um, and at the end of the class, we do surveys on the instructor in the class. In general, is it something that, you know, was it a popular, is it what you expected, those kinds of things. So we try and stop in at least one session of each class. Is there a shelf life for classes? I mean, can you offer them too much at some point? Or are there ones that, I, it seems like the art classes, that people really want those ones all the time, or do you have to tweak them? Or is there just a limited, you can only offer them so many times, you got to stop for a while? kind of continuous yeah we have our our um high ticket classes i guess and so you know sometimes we offer something and it's just a flop you know there was no interest or it wasn't what we thought it would be but for the most part we can run them as long as there's an interest um but i think the art and the ceramics the painting courses those are just students um that continuously take them and so it's just a new project each semester that they're working on. So it, what's interesting about that is when you do an art class, and sometimes with community ed classes, you like I said, you might be in a high school, you have kind of limited, you're kind of going in there to do something, and you don't really have like the full access. But CAC's art rooms are really, they're really sort of robust. They're kind of designed to be able to teach because you're teaching credit classes in there as well. So the facilities must make, uh, have a huge impact on what you're offering and the success. Like at the Saddlebrook Center, I can't offer any art classes because we have carpet. There's no sink in the room. (laughs) So I can't do that there. So right now we're gonna offer an art class in the spring and I can now because we can use the science room. So we always have to look at what's available Mm -hmm. to us um, as far as what the needs are for the instructor to be able to relay the information to students but you're right I like you say the classroom um, we do have really nice um, classrooms and we had a class the geology of the superstitions of the superstition mountains and it was in one of the science labs at SMC in superstition mountain and the the classroom is amazing it's state-of-the-art yeah. science room and when the students went in there they were like wow this is really neat because it's a science lab State of the art science. As lab. opposed to sitting in rows of desks. Yeah. Right. Just it's in a, a lecture room. Yeah. So it's not just I'm watching a PowerPoint on there. I'm it feels Actually like I'm part of it. On. Yes. So how much does the game change for you guys with the Maricopa campus opening up as opposed to being over in the center? Does it give you opportunities to do things you couldn't do before? Like could you do culinary art programs there? That I can't do because um Those that would- those are credit programs, yes. and that's a specific. But having bigger facility over there at that campus, you have more options. I have more options. I'm able to offer a little bit more because I always had to um, work around the credit courses. It was so just limited space. It was, we limited had very limited space. Yeah, the Maricopa, the, the center with the two locations, was basically two large classrooms and then two smaller ones, if I, re- if I recall correctly. Four. four, right, that you could use. And, and they had to be multi-purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, because they were teaching everything in there, um, but having over at the Maricopa campus, you can I guess you can look at your options. Is some of that too? Um, you know, looking at like the Santan area again, you have some limited space in a, in the center, but when that campus o- opens up, that probably gives you some opportunities to explore things you weren't able to before. Very true. Right. Um, we do offer art in Santan now at the center, and like you said. They're running back and forth to the restroom to, for the water because there's not a sink in the room. So, yes, um, the new campus opening up will have a lot more opportunities and just more convenience, I think, for some of the classes that we already offer. When, when As you're developing your spring schedule already, are you developing those classes for the Santan campus? We are trying to. We're, we're trying to expand what we offer now because there is more space and there is more options. I guess some of it, too, is you have to get into the campus probably for a semester to kind of see how. I think that's what we all have to do 
you kind of see how everything works. Right, we're looking at diagrams now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, this is what the room will look like. Well, we talked about because we're going to do a ribbon cutting and an event over there, and I looked at diagrams, but it's really helpful. I get, went over and got a, sort of a tour. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of take a look, and it really helps to get in there to know what you have, which probably makes it hard when you guys are dealing with school districts or outside entities in different parts. It's probably you got to take a time, I guess, to go look at them, or you got to rely on what you're being told of what the facility has. They're actually pretty good, the City of Maricopa and the City of Casa Grande, because they ask me, okay, what is it that you need for this class? And so I will let them know I need a computer, I need desks. I need um, room, just space, and so they're really great about giving or accommodating what the needs are. So, and then working with sort of schools, maybe in the eastern part of the county, or when you're not working directly with the like the two cities, then you're dealing one on one with a lot of different entities and have to match up with that. So, you listen to CAC Live, Tom D. Camillo. Uh, we are visiting with Joel Beck and Muriel Thomas from the Community Ed. Ed program at Central Arizona College. We're talking about the spring, uh, the fall semester coming up here. Uh, and again, if you're interested, you can go to centralaz.edu slash lifelong learning. Yes. And that's where the catalog is. Um, or is there a phone number if people had questions? Can they call or is there an email address people can email questions to? Yeah, for both of us. Why don't Hi. you give out your contact information if people are listening? My phone number is 520-494-6059. Email address muriel.thomas at centralaz.edu. And that's M-U-R-I-E-L yes. dot thomas at centralaz.edu. And then Joel, yours is easy. And I'm Joel, <laughs> J-O-E-L dot Beck, B-E-C-K at centralaz.edu. And my phone number is 480-677-7721. Yes, and CSC does cover two different uh, area codes. So, and, and Mira, you're based at the Casa Grande Center, right? Yes. Which is located at the intersection of Florence and Treckle yes. in Casa Grande. And then, Joel, you have the, the privilege at being at the Superstition Mountain Campus, which doubled in size. How did that change? Because Community Ed seemed to be, when I first came here seven years ago, the hub of it seemed to be at Superstition Mountain Campus, um, at least the most, the most activity. Uh, but you really manage that in half the space that you have now. So the doubling of the space must have really made things, opened up opportunities. Right. When I first started the college um, many years ago, uh, we were the whole team was based out of the Apache Junction campus. So we promoted our classes there. And then over the years, we were we tried to expand to different areas, to Casa Grande especially, or first is who we reached out to was Casa Grande because we had people driving from Casa Grande up here for our classes. So we we're like, let's expand. So like you said, a couple years ago, SMC doubled in size, but at the same time, the program went to a new level as going district wide, so, or county wide. So um, not only did our space grow at, physically at the campus to offer more things, we also grew as a department to offer all across Pinell County. So um, we've been challenged. Um, it's, it's tough, but we, we, we manage somehow. We have a lot of support from the community and our instructors and just our co-workers in the college. So we get it done. I think having the Santan campus open is going to obviously create more opportunities or more demand. I think both. I think there's going to be, because the, the area is growing very quickly and rapidly, um, I think that there's going to be a demand of more needs of the community and things that they want to see, and at the same time, us trying to find instructors to meet those needs and, and the space. We'll have the space, I'm sure, because we're growing throughout Pinnell County in, in all areas, so I think that it'll, it'll work out. When you look at the population census from 2010, and you look at Casa Grande and you look at Maricopa which are two of the largest areas and you put those together that's about roughly the size of the Santan Valley which would be one of the Santan Valley's 80 plus thousand people which would be one of the biggest cities in the if it was a city in the state so and, and a pretty and a different type of community because you have a lot of commuters that are going up into the valley to work like Maricopa has so is that a challenge for both of you in scheduling some of the programs uh, Muriel in Maricopa obviously there's a huge most of the people commute up into the valley Santan you do get a lot of that so do you have to think about that when you're scheduling programs yeah because you have to figure out when's a good time 
So um, sometimes it could be in the evening, sometimes it has to be on the weekends. But now that we're down to uh, working four days a week, so we have to try to condense all of our classes within the four-day work week. Uh, and looking at, we talked a lot about seniors and winter visitors doing it, but the, the community ed programs are really, there's a lot of ages uh, working people use that. What are some of the programs that people have interest in? Are they taking continuing education courses? Are they looking at workforce development type courses? What, if for somebody that's working and not retired, are there programs that people can take? There are. Um, and like we were discussing earlier was the self-interest classes and um, like photography. A lot of working people enjoy the photography classes, so we try and offer those towards the end of the day as opposed to the middle of the day. Um, um, a couple weeks ago, or last month, we offered a class for um, it's Thai table massage, and it was for CEUs for people who were already in the massage industry who needed... Um, continuing education units to carry their license and their certificate so we do things on the community continuing education side and we're going to start offering more opportunities for employers in Pinal County to do some workforce development type offerings is is when you're developing classes you know you talked about workforce development and the community ed type classes is it a different approach between the two do you have to when you're doing something with CEUs as opposed to a personal interest photography class, is there more, is there more legwork that has to be done, more, more detail, or is it just different? It's more detailed because there needs to be an accreditation um, magic word aspect, accreditation <laughs> aspect of it. If the students are getting some sort of credit or recognition of taking this course, so for CEUs, yes, um, this goes with. An individual saying that I've completed this course so I need cre I get credit for it so that's accreditation aspect and accreditation aspect that we need to that we look into in planning this so do you need to contact the accrediting entities to Correct. approve that or is that something you work in partnership with another part of the college or do you guys have to handle that or how does that work we deal with that we deal with the instructors um, and the accreditation that comes along with them so we verify through the the council of that particular industry this one was massage therapy so we had to go to the accreditation board just to verify CAC uh, has a big massage therapy program so I imagine for something like you just talked about you guys probably have discussions with that program about what their students that are out in the working world will need in terms of CEUs right and that's where we rely on the our co-workers here at the college I was working with Susan Pomfret on this and she's the, I believe, the director of the massage therapy program. And um, she said that she had students who needed the CEUs, and she had an instructor to do the Thai table massage. And it just so happened that some of the students over the years that have gone through our the CAC's massage therapy program, program took advantage of this class to get their CEUs. So we, we rely on the college and different departments to help facilitate these kinds of things. You're listening to CAC Live, Tom DiCamillo. Uh, we are visiting with Muriel Thomas and Joel Beck at uh, here on CAC Live, talking about community education and the opportunities. Um, you know, Muriel, how long have you been involved with community education? I think I came on board 2010, the fall of 2010. Mm -hmm. But I've been with the college for 16 years. 16 years, wow. It, for both of you, D is there has there been do you, have you seen changes and maybe Joel you've been doing this longer it, have you seen changes um, in the in sort of the way community ed is delivered and the opportunities or has it always been the same philosophically or philosophically I think it's been the same but I do know that there are other um, opportunities online to do community education type things um, we are trying to keep face to face bring the students back to the campus, have that whole campus life type of thing. Um, Online community ed would almost seem counterintuitive to what you'd want to do for a program like that. Right, and it's out there, but it's just for convenience. People want it, Some people want to do it from home. from home, and it's something that maybe is not offered in their area, and they can reach out online and do it from their own home, something being offered in Florida if they're in Nebraska. Or they do it every day but I like the togetherness. 
it's it seems like that, and I guess it depends on the type of class. But it seems like in a, in a like uh, a photography class, you could do it online and just have somebody giving right, you instructions. That would be a yeah. You know, I like I read it and then just do it. But then, what's the difference of getting a manual and doing it? Where having the camera there, being in the classroom, and actually shooting it, looking at what you shot. Okay, why I had this setting. This is what happened. Why I had this one. This and that. Where an instructor being there, it'd be way more beneficial. Extremely. I think so. Especially with languages, because they do it online as well. But being able to pronounce it right or um, just to um, have a conversation. It's, uh, I've had friends that have taken classes and done kind of listening, and it's like the English language. You know, it's written one way. We all speak a different way. Right. And you learn it one way, and then they go try to speak it, and the person from that native language is going, what the heck are you talking about? That's not how we talk. <laughs> okay. So I tried that with German. It didn't work too well. <laughs> so... Um, let's, uh, we have a few minutes left on the program that uh, actually the time is flying by, but, um, it, let's talk a little bit about, um, how do you, when you're l offering programs during the year, do you offer different types of programs from the fall to the spring Are there things you would offer in the fall that you just wouldn't offer in the spring? And I'm sure in the summer, it's a lot different because you have somewhat of a different audience maybe, or less of an audience. How do you determine when to offer something? I think timing is right. Um, obviously, if we're doing a gardening class, um, we wouldn't offer it in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> and typically, we try and do those kinds of things in, in the spring just because springtime people are trying to take care of or plant mm. things and whatnot. So um, it, I think timing plays an, a part of this. It does. It does. Because it has to be the right season mm -hmm. or else you... They don't benefit as much. Do, do, are there things you'd offer around certain holidays, like leading up to like Christmas or Hanukkah or some of those things, or in the spring you have different holidays? Would you offer like maybe a, a crafts class or something like that? People want to make something for their children, grandchildren, and you're looking at like, you know, the holiday season coming up. Would you offer kind of time something like that or? I know pottery, um, our ceramics classes are popular, or, well, they're popular all year round, but there is a, more of an interest around the holidays, like you said, for gifts and whatnot. And we offered cooking classes in Apache Junction a couple years ago, and those were real big around Valentine's Day. Really? Yeah. For, so for, uh, actually, we had one that was Valentine's dinner for two. So it was a cooking class as to how you can, you know, you and your loved one could create a special valentine's dinner but or cake making and doing it around valentine's day mm -hmm. or the different holidays um we did quilting in saddlebrook so they could do a christmas table runner or thanksgiving so it all depends and we also offered a series on baseball like the history of baseball and watched some um, different different things on baseball and then had a base went on a field trip to a baseball game so obviously we need to plan that right um, during baseball season. Yeah, that a winner is probably not going to work no, for that not. one. No. <laughs> I think you guys did something with spring training games a couple years ago. We did. With the, um, yeah, we were down in Phoenix for that. We offered a whole series on baseball, the history of baseball, and um, something on Babe Ruth, like some special interest classes on that, and then had a field trip to the game. Have you ever done uh, uh, a class on scoring? We haven't. I think you brought that up, though. Yeah, because I've done scoring ago. for like 20-some years. Yeah. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people I watch will bring score sheets to games on how to do it. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing that was developed by a newspaper person back in the early 19-teens. Oh and uh, it's very specific and very detailed. Um, but with the advent of, especially like Little League, they're requiring now parents that are doing that to be a lot more detailed in reporting. Um, I've done it at the college level for 20 some years. So, but even at the high school level, there's more requirements now on some of that stuff as opposed to just, Hey, here's a book, figure it out. And, uh, so you have any spare time in the fall? You I was just going to gonna ask him that. <laughs> I could arrange something. Okay. I could arrange yeah. something. It's, uh, I have some score sheets and I check about 
in the spring, I go through about 500 baseball and softball box scores play by play, looking at them to make sure that they're accurate. And I have a software program that does it um, that I can follow along because it's done electronically. But um, it's a it's it's addictive, mm-hmm. you know. So it might be very it might be very popular. And actually, you can do that kind of anytime because then they're gearing up. Baseball and softball here they play year round because of the weather. Right. Back east. You know, there was snow on the ground till March, so we weren't getting outside till then. So it's um, it's a great way for people if they've never been on a college campus. I always thought community was a great way here at CAC for people to come and make that connection with a college. People like to have some kind of local tie, and they don't know how to do it. But when you come, and they don't want to take, they might not want to take credit classes and be locked into a class, you know, for an entire semester. But you, but your classes sometimes they're just one day, correct? And sometimes they're repetitive, maybe four or five weeks. Right. Yes. Like some of the computer classes we offer um, are about six weeks, two days, three hours each day, um, or, or six hours rather, two hours each day, three hours each day, twice a day <laughs> or twice a week, and the short, very basic courses. Um, and then, like the Tai Chi and most of our health and wellness classes, we do them in increments of five or six weeks. So one hour a day, five or six weeks. So it just depends on the class and the nature of the class. Yeah. Is there any classes that are any subject matters? And it may, not, it may lead to multiple type of classes, but is there any subject matter that really stands out? Like are people interested mostly in the art or do you get a lot of like medical field questions where they don't understand how to navigate healthcare? I imagine with the way the healthcare is going in this country right now, there's so many questions out there on how to navigate it. I know you've offered classes like, you know, understanding Medicaid better, understanding, you know, those kind of things. So is there anything that stands out or that people ask for more often than other than others? I think it's like the health and wellness. I think people like the the Tai Chi's, the meditations, the yogas. A lot of that, because even the holistic classes for the past year kind of got really popular, and then it kind of died down a little bit. But I think the health and wellness is a big thing. And the art, art, art classes are always popular. Um, understanding Social Security benefits, and along with Medicare and Medicaid and all that, um, Imagine the computer classes are you said are pretty popular. Those, yeah, they are. Um, and dealing with our demographic, sometimes that people get a little frustrated because it's overwhelming. You know, all they want to do is send an email. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I just want to send this picture to my kids. You know, how do I do that? And once they learn that, that's all they want to do. So, you know, it's a hit or miss. But for the most part, um, short, sweet, fun classes not too many complaints is is that what are the costs of the classes do they vary from class to class is there a set cost or it kind of depends on the amount of time they spend in the classroom so roughly it's like 25 dollars the least up until a hundred dollars that's about the range we do offer um community service what we call community service seminars and those tend to be um something put on by doctor's offices just for um like the Medicare class, reverse mortgages, um, Cancer. hearing classes, things like that. So we do offer free courses, community service seminars. And people have to sign up for those because you, you, have, you have limited sp- <coughs> excuse me, limited space. Correct. You still register for them. They're a class in our curriculum. We've developed them in the curriculum. We have them in the system for registration purposes. So everything's done on the registration form. Do you find that people are... Um, Take more than one class during uh, during a semester. Always. Yeah. It's very rare to have somebody just take one class. Really? Yeah. You get a sense they come on campus because they just like to be there, and they and they feel a part of something. Well, I know in Apache Junction at the Superstition Mountain Campus, now that we have Starbucks and a, <laughs> and a cafeteria, <laughs> I know that that says a lot. Well, that's interesting because that was always one of the biggest complaints about SMC <coughs> is 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 not being able to get food. I mean, even as employees, you know, we had to go either to the Quick Trip or where that opened up late, or you had to get in your car and drive down to something to get some food. And now there's several options that are open there that probably i see that as making a huge difference even from the young people of staying on campus that did we've seen a lot of just changes there in 
um, Apache Junction with that. Just more students are on campus now. Even the our community members that are taking classes with us, they are in the cafeteria eating lunch. They go to Starbucks and get their coffee when before they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They're like, we just want hot, hot coffee. It's 8:30 in the morning. We need hot coffee, and there's nowhere to get coffee. And so yeah, it, it makes a lot, and I think it has drawn more attention to the campus and has kept people there more throughout the day. I think it's going to be helping Maricopa too because where the Maricopa campus is, there's really nothing yes. food-wise directly around there. And now they have the little snack bar area, so I hear it's good food. It's, I haven't eaten there. It's uh, yeah, they got a really good chicken sandwich. It's very inexpensive. So I was out there yesterday and had it. So it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, it, nice new facility. The glass windows around. Santan is going to have the same kind of thing a- access, and I think that especially Santan, there's nothing really close at all. Near there, yeah. No, so I mean it'll grow eventually, but I think that's a key. Getting people to come and stay is to try to make it as convenient as possible, and having those areas. It, it, SMC, do people come in and use uh, the people taking your classes? Do they come in and use the library and use uh, the computer facilities there? Yeah, they're they're. Anybody who takes classes with us are considered a student of CAC. So they get their student ID card. They're able to get student discounts within the community at the movie theaters, different museums mm-hmm. around town, um, actually worldwide because student memberships. I've, somebody went to the Louvre in France and got a student admission into the museum because the student admission was cheaper than the senior citizen rate so, <laughs> or their discount. So, um, but, yes, the computer labs, the library services – um, they're yeah, they love it. They're on campus more, and they like your events, the entertainment the, piece, the community events pieces. They're already waiting for the, your schedule, so I told them it's out. And so, um, if it's okay with you, we can email it too. Yes, you can take that and forward that out. In fact, we have an updated version. We added a couple things, so we'll get that to you. Yes, that's uh, I believe it's up online now, and it's been emailed out. The community events, some exciting stuff that's going on. At that Central was a Arizona topic College, at lunch and conversation. Oh, was it the entire converse, uh, The yeah, the entire time because they saw some groups that they really liked, and um, so they were planning a day to go out there. Well, yeah, we brought, brought back some groups. The um, the uh, new the Shanghai Cir- new Shanghai Circus. It's that's coming back, and but it's like it's not the same show. That what happens is that they come over from China. It's a different group each time, and they're. I think they're based in Branson, Missouri. I think is where their American sort of school is, where they practice. So each year they bring in an entirely new group and they do something completely different. So even though it has the same name, it's a completely different show. That one sold out quickly last year. I just think the renovation of the Penn Center also has drawn more attention also because you can offer more things and y'all, y'all did a big push last year for it. So I know the community members are excited about excited. that as well. It's, we started seeing people from further away coming down to the programs. Build it so, and they will come. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, like I said, we only have a few minutes here left. Uh, why don't you give out your contact information again if people uh, had questions, if they want to go on the website. Joel, why don't you start? Joel, J-O-E-L dot Beck, B-E-C-K, at centralaz.edu. And my phone number is 480-677-7721. And Muriel Thomas, M-U-R-I-E-L dot T-H-O-M-A-S at centralaz.edu, phone number 520-494-6059. And if they want to go on the website, it's centralaz.edu slash lifelong learning. Yes. And that will have the, you can access the, the publication online that has a list of all the programs that are being offered here uh, this fall. And then the spring one actually will come out sometime before the end of the semester, I believe, right? It will be out in December. December. In December. So people then can sign up. And then and then the summer one generally comes out, you target what, like April-ish? Okay. April. End of April, beginning of May. May. Uh, for that. And um, there's programs available throughout the county. Yes. And it's not just at the CAC locations. And you guys do a tremendous job of covering... Connecticut, as I like to say, of covering <laughs> Pinell County, um, it's uh, it's not an easy task, but there's a lot of opportunities for people, and um, it just seems like people have a lot of fun when they take these classes. We have a lot of fun. It's been crazy, you know. It, yeah, it's uh, and then the um, you know, it's what people don't realize is that you do offer some stuff at some of the centers as well, not just the campuses. Right. And that's what Saddlebrook, Florence, 
Casa Grande, and and um, yeah, those are the the corporate at the center. corporate center is the other one, and the Miracle Campus, and out and uh, and and s- up at the Santan Center for now. Yes, and then right. we'll move over to the campus here in the spring. Uh, for January, so we well, appreciate you guys making the trek out here uh, to the studio, and um, we wanted to get you out here um, to, to talk about these programs. And um, I- again, if anybody has any uh, has any questions, you contact Joel or Muriel here at Central Arizona College, uh, and uh, you know we we, uh, we look forward to seeing what you have, not just for the fall but for the spring. Uh, again, we'd like to thank everyone for listening to CAC Live on KQCK in the Santan Valley. We're here on Thursdays from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. And, uh, you know, it's um, we have some great shows. And don't forget, on October 4th, up in the city of uh, Maricopa at the Maricopa campus, uh, there will be an open house. We'll do our science night. And, Muriel, you may be there. Somebody from the department will be there to talk about all these programs but it'll be our science night. Culinary arts will be there. There'll be a lot of programs. It'll be from six to nine on a Friday night out at at the Maricopa campus. We're going to give an opportunity to sh- to show off uh, that campus, and then uh, we will be doing something in December, a similar thing at the Santan campus. We haven't set the date yet. We have a couple of ideas on dates of when we're going to do it, but we'll announce that in the very near future. Uh, but that will be an opportunity again to come out and visit uh, one of the CACs and two new campuses. Uh, they're fantastic. They are, um, and if you're interested in taking community ed classes, those two facilities will be. You'll get to christen them, yeah. you know, which will be, which is really kind of a, a neat thing to do. So, for Joel and Muriel, I'm Tom DiCamillo, and uh, you're listening to KQCK in the Santan Valley. And uh, Joe Carrera will be back here shortly, and then uh, he'll return to music for the next 30 minutes. Again, thanks for listening to CAC Live on KQCK in the Santan Valley.